Please rise. Blessed is the person whose rebellion is forgiven, whose sins are covered. Here again, words written for us in Matthew chapter 9. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Take heart, child, your sins are forgiven. You may be seated. My fellow redeemed. He had traveled for miles, sleeping in the mud, begging for a hunk of bread. And then he entered the royal city, went to the royal court, spoke there with some of the soldiers and the captains, and finally to the advisors, to the king. He had a petition. Only the king could help him. His family, his farm, his village, his land, the king's own people were all in danger. Would the king help him? Would the king act? He looked at his shabby clothes. They didn't fit in. He heard his speech. It was so simple and unrefined compared to that of those around him. He was out of place. He had to hope. It was all up to the king. He had all the authority. We don't generally depend on kings. But we know that feeling of helplessness when you have a problem and you Google how to get it fixed. And then you print out the form, you fill it out carefully, and you bring it to a place where they tell you you have to bring it, and then you sit in that waiting room for what seems like hours and hours. And you hand that precious form to someone who is completely disinterested. And they take it and they put it in a separator that files it on top of a stack of papers just like yours. And then she looks at you and says, how much time it will be until you can expect to hear something. You have to hope that someone cares. You have to hope that someone is listening. You have to hope that someone is able to do something and that person will sometime hold that special form that you filled out. You don't really know who is in authority, who can help you. You just hope someone We all see problems out there in this world. And we all wish that there was some place that we could take them. We can point to trouble in our lives, in our hearts, problems we know need a solution. But no one seems to have the authority to change things. For his people, God set up a system, a way they could take their petitions to the Lord, to the Almighty One, to the ultimate authority, and he would hear them. But then Jesus came, and he bypassed that whole system. The experts in the law heard him, and they could not believe their ears. Who does this rabbi think he is? And then Jesus showed them. More importantly for us, he shows us. He has the authority. Take heart. His forgiveness is more than just talk. Poor man just couldn't catch a break. He couldn't walk and there were no wheelchairs or walkers or ramps to help him get to where he wanted to go. He was generally despised by the people around him. They saw him as cursed and dirty and maybe rejected by God. He didn't have a job. There was no desk waiting for his skills, and so he had to beg and depend on the kindness of others. Then they heard about this rabbi in Galilee this Jesus of Nazareth, and the things they were hearing, they were amazing things. They said, Jesus can heal anyone. He even cleansed lepers. They had to go find this Jesus. 
And so those friends who still cared for him, four of them, they heard that Jesus was in Capernaum and they went there to find him. It didn't take them long to figure out where he was. The crowd gave him away. They were pressed and filling every nook and cranny of the house, pressed against the windows, filling the doors, spilling out into the streets. They had found him. They had come so far. He was right there. They were so close, but the crowd, it wouldn't budge. He was right there. They could even hear a little bit of his voice, but they had no way to get to him. They just couldn't catch a break. Then Mark tells us they thought of a plan. They could not wait. So they used the roof access. They hooked up some ropes. They began to take apart the roof to make a hole just big enough and then they swung him over and began to lower him down. It's not like they could have injured him any worse than he already was and they had to get him in front of Jesus. It's hard for us to imagine that that commotion wouldn't have caused a bit of a disturbance. That how long... They must have all just stopped in that room and gazed up at the spectacle of the man being lowered down in front of them. Certainly, Jesus couldn't have kept on teaching while this was happening. He had interrupted everything. How his spirits must have sunk as he felt all those eyes staring at him being lowered into the room. This was a stupid idea. Why should Jesus help him, especially now? They are going to be so furious. His cheeks burned with shame as he fought back the tears, imagining how they would roughly grab him and toss him back out into the street. All the reasons why the rabbi wouldn't heal him, couldn't heal him, shouldn't heal him, ran through his mind. His heart began to pound. This wasn't the attention he was hoping for. They had been so focused on getting here, on seeing Jesus. He had built up in his mind what it would be like, the interaction they would have, how he would meet the Lord. But now, this wasn't what he had imagined. Nothing had gone right. He was there lying at Jesus' mercy, and he didn't know what the rabbi, this miracle worker, would say. When we create a craft, something great, a project, maybe fix a car, make a contraption or something like that. We want to put it on display for others to admire. When we post pictures online, we post our best. Look at the places I have been. Look at the great things I get to do. Look at my happy family. Everyone wants to be noticed, well, sort of. Really, we want everyone to notice what we want them to see. No one wants to be the subject of a viral fail video. No one wants to be caught on tape doing something embarrassing. A student is ashamed to stand next to that science project that didn't go so well because he put it off till the morning of. When we do discuss our failings, maybe with our friends or our online friends, we usually put them in fun, cute terms, showing how human we are, some way that they can relate to us and commiserate with us and show us the proper amount of pity and compassion and encouragement, positive or negative. We always want to control our image. How are we going to control our image to God? Can we possibly present God with only our best works, put them on display for him so that he can admire them? He who created the heavens and the earth. Will he accept our pictures of a lovely family and a happy and full life? Is God going to be fooled if we act like our problems are just cute little small things, only human, when he can see the full ugliness? of our sins. You cannot wait to see God until you are ready, until you are prepared, until you have everything together, until you have enough sleep, until you've made a plan, until you've gotten yourself all presentable. 
You cannot wait until you have nothing. No one in the way, no obstacles between you and the Lord because life is always throwing up obstacles between us and God. Our sinful natures are always telling us we should avoid him. Satan is making sure that everything seems insurmountable. Anything to keep you away from Jesus in your time of need. Those people, they knew they needed Jesus. But this isn't quite how they wanted to meet him. Then Jesus looked at him. He peered up through that hole in the ceiling and saw those four faces staring down, and he saw them. He saw their hearts. He saw their faith. They had come here because of all the good news they had heard about Jesus this wasn't the entrance they were hoping for, but they believed they just had to get their friend to Jesus and Jesus would do the rest. And then the unexpected happened. He didn't rebuke them. He didn't scowl. He didn't turn his nose up at the man lying there at his feet. Instead, he said, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Take heart, child. Your sins are forgiven. He was a mess, an interruption. They damaged that home. But Jesus looked down at him and said, Take heart. You can always, you will always hear the same response from your Lord. Take heart. Jesus sees you. Take heart, he sees you at your worst. Take heart, he sees you at your most miserable and he says, take heart. So take heart. Go to Jesus. Take heart, he will remove your fear. He will lift you out of despair. Take heart, none of those reasons that you build up in your mind, all those reasons why you can't go to him, why you should stay away, why it's not the right time, all those reasons you think that you are unworthy, Jesus doesn't even consider them. Take heart. Nothing will stop him. You know exactly what mood you will find him in. You always know what response he has for the hurting heart and the troubled soul. Take heart, because Jesus welcomes all who come to him in faith. He welcomes all who are carried into his presence. Take heart. He sees you. He loves you. Take heart, because his heart is moved with kindness and compassion. Take heart, dear children of God. Your sins are all forgiven. Is there an audible gasp at those words? Perhaps unheard because of the din of the crowd and the commotion that was happening around them. Certainly some gave an incredulous chuckle as they grumbled to each other. He's blaspheming. <laughs> Who can possibly forgive God? sins except God alone. We can understand. What did any of them know about this man? And so they could reason, what could Jesus possibly know about this man? What did they know about what he had done? Did they know what sacrifices he had offered to the Lord? When was the last time he had even attended a Passover? Was he a keeper of the Sabbath? What did they know about him? Did he try his best to lead a good life? None of them knew what sins belonged to him or what those sins deserved. And then this Jesus, this rabbi, this man from Nazareth, he, he says his sins are all forgiven. The audacity of it. This is our reaction to such full and free forgiveness. It can't be that easy. It can't be true. It can't be right. Perhaps when we see all those sinners out there in the world, the thieves, the murderers, the abusers, those who mock the Lord and live apart from him, God's forgiveness can't really be for them, can it? Perhaps when we look into our own hearts, you 
Yes, you. Even though I say it every week, when you hear those words, you think to yourself, yes, but pastor doesn't really know. Pastor doesn't really know what I've done, what I've said, what I think, the things my hands have touched. If he really knew what I was like, then he wouldn't be so free with the F word, with forgiveness. We imagine that people that we need to go to church as some sort of penance, that we have to do something, make it up to God somehow so that he will possibly find it in his heart to forgive us. Something has to be done. God's commands need to be followed. His ceremonies need to be fulfilled. We can't be forgiven just like that. Since Jesus knew their thoughts, and yes, that means he knows our thoughts, our judgmental thoughts and our doubts. He said, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Those things seem to come from a noble place. We are defending God's honor. We are defending God's church against being besmirched with the unworthy. It seems we are making sure that no one is given a free pass. We want justice to to be served. We want people motivated so that they will try to do the right thing. And so we think we are doing our best, but with our best of intentions, we don't realize that these thoughts come from the devil. Jesus calls these things evil. But he does more than rebuke. He makes a demonstration. What is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up, take your stretcher, and walk. Forgiveness cannot be seen. There's no way to prove whether forgiveness is done. His words cannot be tested, and so certainly that would be easier. And yet, at the same time, forgiveness acknowledges a sin, a wrong, something that demands justice, that needs to be forgiven. And we all know that that word, forgiveness, can be so hard to say. And it can be so hard for us to put into practice. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And at that, Jesus turned to the man still lying there on the floor in front of him. He said to him, Get up, take your stretcher, and go home. The man did it. He got up. And went home. And the significance of this moment was not lost on the crowd. You see, those experts in the law, they had thrown down the challenge. You can't say these things, Jesus. Who do you think you are? Perhaps they were waiting to hear the thunder, waiting for God to smite him for saying such a thing right there on the spot. But instead, all the people saw Jesus spoke and the man walked. His words had power. God did not stop him. Those experts in the law could do nothing to stop him. That was authority. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and glorified God, who had given such authority to men. When there's a monarchy, the authority passes down from one generation to another. Although sometimes a strong rebellion might arise and some new leader or warlord or dictator might arise and they rule by the strength of their might and the power of their influence and they keep everybody in line through fear. Today we believe that authority is derived from the consent of the governed and so people rise through bureaucracy or perhaps they do their time in political life and we divide our authority into thousands of little pieces, hoping some might do a little good and others can only do a little bad. How did Jesus get his authority? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has 
been made. Jesus is the almighty God in the flesh. He is God in action, God's eternal word. But he is not outside of creation. He is not outside the law. He enters into this world. He is born under the law. And he himself testifies, Do not think that I came to abolish the law, but that the law may be fulfilled in me. He has authority to forgive sins because he had no sin that needed forgiving himself. He has power. His power over sin is unquestioned. Because he destroyed its effects everywhere he went, he carried all of our diseases and all of our infirmities. From him, Satan and his demons must turn and run. Every miracle he did was to fix the damage that our sins have done and to testify and demonstrate his ultimate authority on earth to remove your guilt forever. When Jesus speaks to you, take heart, child. Your sins are all forgiven. He speaks as the Almighty God. He speaks as your brother who has experienced all the pains and suffering of this world. He speaks as God's prophet proclaiming God's will to God's people. He speaks as the great high priest, the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He speaks as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He speaks as Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Do not be afraid, he says. Take heart. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead and look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Now that is authority. That is authority that gets things done. That is authority you can trust. That is the authority on which we must rely. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he immediately sends out his disciples, his servants, go and make disciples. He gives them his authority. He tells them, whatever you release on earth will be released in heaven. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. You know what Jesus will say when you come to him. And so you also know what I will say, what any faithful pastor will say. Whatever you have done, whatever sin troubles you, be it great or seemingly small in the world's eyes, whenever you enter these doors, you enter into God's holy royal chamber. And as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, that is, according to his right, by his power, so that nothing can stop these words from saving you by his authority. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us join now in confessing our common faith with the words.